Judge Henry Gaines was no ordinary man. In his late fifties, with a tall, imposing frame and a distinguished air, he had spent over three decades navigating the intricate labyrinth of the law. A black man with deep brown skin, short graying hair, and a meticulously maintained beard. His face was marked by years of experience, wisdom, and a deep commitment to justice. He wore his robe like a badge of honor, and every decision he made was a reflection of his belief that the law should be fair, impartial, and serve every individual with integrity. Henry had faced many battles in his life to get to where he was, a judge presiding over high-profile cases in one of the busiest courthouses in the state. Born and raised in a rough neighborhood, he had beaten the odds through hard work, determination, and an unwavering commitment to bettering his community. His courtroom was more than just a place to dispense legal rulings. It was a place where fairness reigned, where all voices could be heard, and where the scales of justice were never tipped by race, background, or status. Yet despite all his accomplishments, Henry had never forgotten his roots. He was known for his compassion as much as his sternness. His rulings were fair but firm, and he always took the time to explain the law to those who stood before him. It was this balance of strength and empathy that earned him the respect of many and the ire of some who saw his position as an affront to the old order. Every morning, Henry walked confidently into the courthouse, greeting security, staff, and attorneys alike. But on this particular day, something felt different. There was an uneasy energy in the air, a feeling he couldn't quite shake. Little did he know, an encounter was waiting for him, one that would test everything he believed about the law, justice, and the very society he served. Henry took a deep breath as he approached the grand steps of the courthouse ready to face another day of hearings and trials. The towering pillars of the courthouse rose before him, a testament to the power of the law and a symbol of the justice he upheld. As he walked through the familiar path to the entrance, he had no idea that a storm was brewing just beyond the courthouse doors. It started out like any other day. Henry approached the courthouse door, his black judge's robe flowing elegantly behind him, and nodded to the courthouse security officers who stood at the entrance. Most greeted him with respectful nods, recognizing the familiar face of the esteemed judge. But there was one officer, Officer McCarthy, a white man in his forties, new to the courthouse, who didn't return the nod. Instead, McCarthy's face twisted into a sneer as he stepped forward, blocking Henry's path. Hold it right there, McCarthy barked, raising his hand. His voice carried an edge that immediately put Henry on alert. What are you doing here? Henry paused, his brow furrowing in confusion. Excuse me? He replied, his voice calm yet firm. I'm Judge Gaines. I need to get to my courtroom. He pointed toward the courthouse doors where he had walked countless times before without any issue. But the look in McCarthy's eyes told him this encounter was not going to go as smoothly as usual. McCarthy didn't budge. I don't care who you say you are, he snapped. This entrance is for authorized personnel only, and I don't know you. The officer's eyes bore into Henry's, filled with suspicion and hostility. There was an unspoken tension in the air, a tension that Henry knew all too well. It was the same tension he had faced growing up in a world that often saw his skin color before his accomplishments. Henry took a steadying breath. Officer, I am authorized personnel. I'm a judge in this courthouse, and I have a docket to attend to this morning. He reached into his pocket to pull out his ID badge, hoping to defuse the situation quickly. But McCarthy's hand flew to his belt, gripping his radio as if expecting trouble. Keep your hands where I can see them, the officer barked, his voice rising in aggression. I'm going to need you to step aside while I check your credentials. Next. Henry was used to standing his ground in the courtroom, where his authority was absolute. But standing on the steps of the courthouse, confronted by an officer who clearly saw him as a threat, he felt an unfamiliar sense of vulnerability. It was clear to Henry that McCarthy was not treating him like a judge. He was being treated like an intruder, like someone who didn't belong. The security officers who had been standing nearby exchanged uneasy glances. They knew who Henry was. He had presided over countless cases in their courthouse. But the aggression in McCarthy's stance was enough to make them hesitate. No one stepped forward to intervene, and the silence around them felt heavy as if the whole courthouse was holding its breath. Henry felt his anger rising, 
but he forced himself to stay calm. He had learned long ago that in situations like this, any sign of anger could be misconstrued as aggression. Officer McCarthy, Henry said slowly, his voice steady, I assure you that I belong here. I am a judge. If you radio in, you will find that I am exactly who I say I am. But McCarthy wasn't interested in listening. He moved closer, his hand still hovering near his belt, as if daring Henry to make a wrong move. You think you can just walk in here and do whatever you want? McCarthy spat. Not on my watch. You're going to wait right here until I get to the bottom of this. The moment felt surreal to Henry. He had spent his entire career fighting for justice, ensuring that everyone who stood before him received fair treatment. Yet here he was, standing outside his own courthouse, being treated like a criminal for reasons that had nothing to do with his actions and everything to do with how he looked. Henry could feel the eyes of the security officers and passers-by on him, some looking on with shock, others with curiosity. He felt a swell of defiance rise within him. This was bigger than him. This was about how people like him were seen, about the biases that people carried, even those who were supposed to uphold the law. And Henry knew in that moment that he could not let this slide. Not today. Word of the confrontation at the courthouse entrance spread quickly. By the time Henry finally made his way inside, escorted by a courthouse clerk who confirmed his identity, a crowd had gathered in the main atrium. Lawyers, clerks, defendants, and other officers were abuzz with murmurs of what had just transpired. Henry's courtroom was already filled, the morning's case delayed by the incident outside. He could see the looks of concern on the faces of those who waited, the plaintiffs, the defense attorneys, the jurors. Henry walked to his chambers to gather himself. The encounter with McCarthy had rattled him more than he cared to admit. He sat down in his leather chair, taking deep breaths, trying to center himself for the day ahead. But as he thought about what had just happened, he felt the weight of injustice pressing down on him. How could he dispense justice when he himself had just been a victim of prejudice? The bailiff, an older Hispanic woman named Maria, who had worked with Henry for years, knocked gently on the door. Judge Gaines, she said softly, her voice full of sympathy. The courtroom is ready for you, and I'm so sorry about what happened. Henry nodded, managing a small smile. Thank you, Maria. Let's proceed. He stood, putting on his robe and walking with dignity back into the courtroom. The buzz in the room quieted as he entered, and all eyes turned to him. He knew that people were waiting to see how he would handle the morning's docket. But more than that, they were waiting to see how he would handle what had happened to him. Judge Gaines banged his gavel, the familiar sound echoing through the room. This court is now in session, he declared, his voice steady and strong. He would not let the morning's events cloud his judgment. He was here to uphold the law, to give every person in his courtroom a fair hearing. But as he proceeded with the day's cases, he knew that his own fight for justice had only just begun. That evening, after a long day of hearings and judgments, Henry sat alone in his chambers, the weight of the day pressing down on his shoulders. The confrontation with Officer McCarthy had sparked something deep within him, a feeling that, despite all his accomplishments, despite the robe he wore and the title he held, he was still vulnerable to the same prejudices that so many others faced every day. Henry replayed the events in his mind. He thought about the officer's hostility, the way he had been treated as though he were a potential criminal rather than a respected judge. He knew that if he hadn't been Judge Gaines, the situation could have escalated in. Later that evening, as Henry sat in his chambers reflecting on the day's events, he received a call from an old friend, Carl Thompson, a prominent civil rights attorney who had been Henry's ally and confidant for years. Carl's deep, familiar voice brought a moment of relief to the judge's otherwise heavy day. Henry, I heard what happened at the courthouse today, Carl said, his voice filled with a mix of anger and concern. Are you okay? Henry sighed, leaning back in his chair. I'm fine, he replied, though his voice held the exhaustion of someone who had faced more than just a difficult day. But it's not about me being okay, Carl. It's about what this means. If it can happen to me, a judge in my own courthouse? What does that say about how officers view people who look like us? There was silence on the other end of the line as Carl absorbed his words. 
You know I've seen this kind of thing happen a thousand times before, Carl said finally. But seeing it happen to you, that hits different. It's a reminder that no matter how high you climb, how much you achieve, there's always someone ready to see you as less than. Henry's mind raced as they spoke. Carl had fought for years to change laws, to bring justice to those who had been wronged by the system. And now more than ever, Henry felt compelled to do the same. We need to do something about this, Henry said, his voice steady with determination. It's not enough to sit back and let this slide. We need to hold people accountable. Carl's voice grew serious. If you're ready to fight this, you know I've got your back. And I know a lot of people who would be ready to stand with you. But you've got to be prepared, Henry. This is going to be a battle. Henry nodded even though Carl couldn't see him. I know, he said, but it's a battle worth fighting. The next morning, Judge Gaines made a decision. He walked into the courthouse with the same authority he always carried. But today was different. Today he was not just Judge Gaines. He was a man on a mission to confront injustice. And that meant facing Officer McCarthy once again. As he approached the courthouse entrance, he saw McCarthy standing at his post, wearing the same sneer he'd had the day before. But today, Henry wasn't going to let it pass. He walked right up to McCarthy, his expression firm and unyielding. Officer McCarthy, he began, his voice carrying a tone that demanded attention. I want to speak to you about yesterday. McCarthy's eyes flickered with surprise, but his face remained defiant. Oh, yeah. And what about yesterday, he replied, his tone dripping with sarcasm. He didn't seem to understand or care that the man standing before him was not only a judge, but someone who could expose his actions to the world. Henry stood his ground. Yesterday, you treated me with disrespect and suspicion, not because of my actions, but because of your assumptions about me. I am a judge, but more than that, I am a man who will not tolerate discrimination. You need to understand that your actions have consequences. McCarthy scoffed, crossing his arms over his chest. And what are you gonna do about it? He challenged, his face twisting into a smirk. Cry to the higher-ups? File a complaint? Good luck with that. Henry didn't flinch. He knew what he was going to do. But it wasn't just about filing a complaint or making a scene. It was about something much bigger. You'll see what I do, officer, Henry said calmly and I promise you it will make a difference. Henry knew that if he wanted to affect real change, he needed to use his position and his voice. So he did something bold. He called a special session in his courtroom to address the incident, inviting members of the courthouse, local media, and civil rights organizations. It was time to bring the issue to light and hold the system accountable. The courtroom was filled with an audience that included lawyers, activists, local news reporters, and even some curious onlookers who had heard about the confrontation. Henry sat at his bench, the polished wooden gavel in front of him, symbolizing the authority of his position. But today, he wasn't just presiding over a case. He was taking a stand against a system that had allowed racism and prejudice to go unchecked. Today, we are not here to judge a criminal case, Henry began, his voice resonating through the courtroom. We are here to discuss an incident that took place outside these very doors, an incident that speaks to the biases and prejudices that still exist in our society, and unfortunately, within our institutions of justice. Henry recounted the events of the previous day in clear, unflinching detail. He spoke about being stopped, questioned, and treated with suspicion by Officer McCarthy. He spoke about the assumptions that had been made about him because of the color of his skin. And he spoke about the need for change, not just within the police department, but within the justice system as a whole. As he spoke, the atmosphere in the room shifted. People listened intently, some with anger, others with tears. And when Henry finished, the courtroom erupted into applause. It wasn't just a show of support. It was a rallying cry for justice, for equality, and for an end to the prejudice that so often went unchallenged. The aftermath of the courtroom session was explosive. News outlets picked up the story, running headlines like Judge Confronts Racist Officer in Courthouse and Judge Gaines Takes a Stand for Justice. Social media was ablaze with discussions, debates, and calls for action. People were inspired by Henry's courage, while others criticized him for what they saw as a public spectacle. Henry received a flood of messages, 
some from supporters who thanked him for speaking out, others from those who saw his actions as an attack on law enforcement. You're a hero, one email read. Thank you for standing up for all of us who've been treated unfairly. But there were also messages like, you're making this about race when it's really about respecting authority. Shame on you. The courthouse itself was divided. Some of the staff, particularly those who had experienced discrimination in their own lives, rallied around Henry, offering words of encouragement and support. But others, including some police officers and courthouse officials, saw his actions as a challenge to their authority. The tension in the building was palpable, and Henry could feel the eyes on him whenever he walked the halls. Carl, his attorney friend, called him regularly to check in. How are you holding up, man? Carl would ask. This isn't going to be easy, but you've got a lot of people behind you, and we're not going to let you fight this alone. Carl also brought news of support from civil rights organizations, lawyers and community leaders who were ready to back Henry in his fight. Despite the backlash, Henry felt a sense of empowerment. He had spoken his truth and now the world was listening. And while the road ahead would be difficult, he was ready to face it, ready to confront not just Officer McCarthy, but the biases and injustices that had plagued the system for far too long. Amid the growing media attention and public pressure, the local police department was forced to respond. The chief of police, a middle-aged black man named Chief Nelson, reached out to Henry, requesting a private meeting. Henry knew this meeting would be crucial. It was an opportunity to demand accountability and ensure that what happened to him was addressed seriously. They met in Chief Nelson's office, a formal space lined with plaques, awards, and pictures of officers in the line of duty. The atmosphere was tense as Henry took a seat across from the chief, who wore a somber expression. Judge Gaines, Chief Nelson began, his voice calm but firm. I want to start by saying that I am deeply sorry for what happened to you. Officer McCarthy's actions do not reflect the values of our department, and we are taking this matter very seriously. Henry nodded, listening carefully. I appreciate that, Chief Nelson, he replied, but this isn't just about an apology. This is about ensuring that your officers understand their duty to serve and protect all members of the community, regardless of race. It's about accountability and making sure that what happened to me doesn't happen to anyone else. Chief Nelson leaned forward, his face showing genuine concern. I understand, Judge Gaines. And I agree with you. That's why I'm initiating an internal investigation into Officer McCarthy's conduct. But I also want to work with you on something bigger. Police training, community engagement, and policies that will help prevent this kind of incident from happening again. Henry felt a surge of hope. This was the kind of response he had wanted, a commitment not just to punish, but to reform. If you're willing to work with me, Chief Nelson, Henry said, extending his hand, then I'm willing to do everything I can to help improve the relationship between law enforcement and the community. The chief shook Henry's hand, sealing a partnership that would be crucial to creating real change. And as Henry left the meeting, he felt a renewed sense of purpose. The road ahead would be long and there would be resistance. But for the first time in a long while, he felt that change was possible, that justice could prevail. Following the meeting with Chief Nelson, Henry took his fight to the community. He knew that true reform would require the support of those who had been most affected by discrimination. And he wanted to hear their stories, their struggles, and their ideas for change. The incident at the courthouse had struck a chord with many, and it was time to bring those voices together. Henry organized a town hall meeting at a local church, a place that had long served as a hub for social change and community support. The turnout was overwhelming. People of all ages and backgrounds packed into the church hall, sitting on benches, leaning against walls, and even standing outside to listen through the open windows. There were mothers who worried about their sons, activists who had long fought for police reform, and ordinary citizens who were tired of feeling like they were not treated equally. The atmosphere was electric, charged with a mix of hope, frustration, and a desire for change. Henry stood at the front of the room, looking out at the sea of faces, some familiar, others new. He felt a wave of emotion rise within him. This was his community, and they were ready to fight for justice alongside him. Henry spoke openly and passionately about what had happened to him 
about the challenges of being a black man in a position of authority, and about the need for systemic change. He shared his vision for a justice system that was truly fair, one that protected all citizens equally and held those in power accountable for their actions. As he spoke, nods of agreement rippled through the crowd, and there were moments of applause, cheers, and even tears. When Henry finished, he opened the floor for others to speak. One by one, people stood up to share their own stories, stories of discrimination, fear, and hope. A young black man spoke about being stopped by the police for fitting the description. A middle-aged Latina woman talked about how she felt her community was constantly targeted by law enforcement. An older white man, a retired police officer, admitted that he had seen biases within his own department and was ready to support change. And have by the end of the meeting, the room was filled with a sense of unity and purpose. People exchanged contact information, formed working groups, and pledged to stay involved in the fight for justice. And as Henry walked out of the church that night, he felt a deep sense of empowerment. This wasn't just his fight anymore. It belonged to the whole community. One of the first tangible steps toward reform was the implementation of a new training program for police officers, training that would focus on bias awareness, de-escalation techniques, and community relations. Henry was invited to participate in the development of the curriculum, working alongside Chief Nelson, local leaders, and training experts. It was an opportunity to address the root issues that had led to his own confrontation with Officer McCarthy. Henry attended the first day of training, which took place at the police department's headquarters. Dozens of officers, including Officer McCarthy, sat in a large training room, their faces a mix of curiosity, skepticism, and guardedness. Some were receptive to the new approach, while others seemed to view it as an attack on their work and authority. The training began with a session on implicit bias, led by a specialist who spoke about the ways in which stereotypes and assumptions could influence behavior. Henry watched as the officers participated in exercises designed to help them recognize their own biases and understand how those biases could impact their work. There were moments of discomfort, moments of resistance, but also moments of genuine self-reflection. Henry was invited to speak, and he stood before the officers, speaking not as a judge, but as a man who had faced prejudice. I'm not here to blame or shame anyone, he said, his voice steady. I'm here to make sure that what happened to me, and to so many others, doesn't keep happening. We all want the same thing, to serve our community, to protect people, and to build a system that is fair to everyone. And that starts with understanding one another. His words hung in the air, and for a moment, the room was silent. Then one officer raised his hand. Judge Gaines, I'm willing to learn, the officer said. I want to be better, but sometimes it feels like we're expected to do everything perfectly, all the time. How do we find that balance? Henry nodded thoughtfully. It's not about perfection, he replied. It's about progress. It's about being willing to acknowledge our mistakes, to learn from them, and to do better. And that's something we can all strive for. Matter. During one of the breaks in the training session, Henry found himself face to face with Officer McCarthy. The tension between them was palpable. It was the first time they had spoken since that fateful morning at the courthouse. Henry could see the uncertainty in McCarthy's eyes, the way he shifted his weight from one foot to the other, as if deciding whether to walk away or engage. McCarthy cleared his throat, avoiding direct eye contact. Judge Gaines, he began awkwardly, his voice lower than before. I... I know what happened that day wasn't right. I didn't treat you with the respect you deserved. And... I'm sorry for that. Henry studied McCarthy's face, trying to gauge the sincerity behind the words. He saw a man who was struggling, struggling to reconcile his own biases, his own pride, and the reality of what he had done. It wasn't an easy thing to apologize, especially not in front of someone who had called you out publicly. I appreciate your apology, Officer McCarthy, Henry said finally, his voice calm but firm. But understand that it's not just about apologizing to me. It's about recognizing how your actions affect the people you're supposed to serve. And it's about making sure that every person you encounter is treated with the dignity and respect they deserve. McCarthy nodded slowly his face a mix of relief and reflection. I hear you, he said, and I'm going to do my best to change. 
I don't want to be the kind of officer who makes people feel unsafe or unwelcome. The exchange was brief, but it was a start, a step toward healing, understanding, and accountability. Henry knew that McCarthy's words would need to be backed up by actions, but he also believed in the power of growth. People could change if they were willing to confront their own prejudices and take responsibility for their actions. And maybe, just maybe, this was the beginning of that change for McCarthy. The story of Judge Henry Gaines and his confrontation with Officer McCarthy continued to resonate beyond the courthouse walls. News outlets, blogs, and social media platforms shared updates on the training program, the community's response, and Henry's commitment to reform. It wasn't long before he was invited to speak at events, both locally and nationally, to share his story and inspire others to join the fight for justice. One such event was a civil rights summit attended by lawyers, activists, politicians, and community leaders from across the country. Henry stood at a podium in a large conference hall, the spotlight shining down on him as he spoke about the challenges and triumphs of standing up against prejudice. He spoke about the power of storytelling, the way that sharing one's truth could open minds and hearts, and the way that confronting injustice could lead to meaningful change. I am a judge, Henry said, his voice echoing through the room. But more than that, I am a man, a man who wants to see a world where the color of your skin does not determine how you are treated, where justice is not just a word but a reality. And I believe that together we can create that world. The audience rose to their feet in applause, a sea of people standing in solidarity with Henry's message. Among them were black and white, young and old, people from different walks of life who shared a common goal, to build a more just and equitable society. And as Henry looked out at the faces before him, he felt a surge of hope. He was not alone in this fight, and that knowledge gave him the strength to keep pushing forward. The summit led to new connections, partnerships, and opportunities for collaboration. Organizations reached out to Henry, asking how they could implement similar reforms in their own communities. Schools and universities invited him to speak to students about leadership, justice, and the power of standing up for what is right. And through it all, Henry remained committed to his role as both a judge and an advocate for change. Amid all the public attention and community work, Henry found solace and support in his family. His wife, Diane, a strong, intelligent black woman who had been by his side since law school, and their two children, Sarah and Michael, who looked up to their father as a role model and hero. They were his anchor, the ones who kept him grounded even as the world around him seemed to spin faster and faster. One evening after a long day of work and meetings, Henry sat down with his family for dinner. The meal was simple, but the atmosphere was warm, filled with laughter and conversation. Diane looked at her husband with a mixture of love and admiration. Henry, you've done so much already, she said, her voice filled with pride. I know it hasn't been easy, but I'm so proud of the way you've stood up for what's right. Sarah, their teenage daughter with long braids and bright eyes, chimed in. Dad, my friends at school are talking about you. They keep saying how cool it is that you're fighting for justice. And it makes me really proud to be your daughter. Henry felt a lump rise in his throat. He had faced criticism, backlash, and difficult moments. But knowing that his family supported him and believed in him made every struggle worthwhile. He reached out to hold Diane's hand then turned to Sarah and Michael. I'm proud of all of you, he said, and I want you to remember that standing up for what's right is never easy, but it's always worth it. And if you ever face injustice, don't be afraid to speak out. Don't be afraid to fight back. The family continued to eat, their bonds stronger than ever. And as Henry sat with his wife and children, he felt a deep sense of peace and determination. This fight was not just for him, it was for them for his community, and for everyone who deserved to live in a world where justice truly meant something. As the months passed, the reforms Henry had advocated for began to show real results within the police department in the courthouse community. Officers who once resisted the bias training now spoke openly about how it had changed their perspectives. Complaints against the police dropped, and officers began building stronger relationships with the neighborhoods they patrolled. The ripple effect of these changes was felt not just within the police force, but throughout the entire community. One afternoon, Henry sat in a local diner, 
grabbing a quick lunch between court sessions. He was approached by a young white officer, barely in his mid-twenties, who looked both nervous and determined. Judge Gaines, the officer asked, his voice soft but clear. I just wanted to say thank you. The training, it's made me see things differently. I used to think that talking about bias meant calling me a racist, but now I understand that it's about learning to see beyond my assumptions. It's about treating people like people. Henry's eyes softened as he listened. He saw in this officer the potential for change, the willingness to grow. I appreciate you saying that, Henry replied. The fact that you're willing to reflect and improve, that's the kind of leadership we need. Keep doing the work and keep setting an example for those around you. The officer nodded, a look of determination on his face. I will, sir, I promise. Henry knew that this was only the beginning. Changing the culture of a police department, of an entire community, was not something that happened overnight. But the fact that officers were willing to learn, to challenge their own biases, and to build trust with the communities they served, gave Henry hope that true, lasting change was possible. In the wake of Henry's public fight for justice, the courthouse staff, clerks, bailiffs, attorneys, and even other judges, rallied together to promote a culture of inclusivity and equality. Judge Gaines's experience had shown a light on issues that had long been whispered about but rarely addressed, and it was time to make sure that the courthouse lived up to its ideals of fairness for all. The first step was the formation of a diversity and inclusion committee, which Henry co-chaired alongside Maria, his trusted bailiff. The committee met regularly to discuss ways to improve the working environment for all courthouse employees from training on cultural competency to establishing channels for reporting and addressing bias. It wasn't just about policies. It was about fostering a sense of respect and understanding among everyone who walked through those courthouse doors. Henry took special pride in mentoring young clerks and aspiring lawyers, many of whom were inspired by his story. He met with them over coffee, shared his journey, and listened to their hopes and challenges. The law isn't just about rules and statutes, he would tell them. It's about people, real people with real lives. And it's our job to make sure that the law serves everyone fairly. Never forget that. One day, as he walked down the hallway, Henry overheard a young Latina clerk comforting a colleague who had faced a racially insensitive comment from a coworker. Remember what Judge Gaines always says, the clerk whispered encouragingly. Don't let anyone make you feel like you don't belong. You have just as much right to be here as anyone else. Henry felt a swell of pride. The message was spreading, not just in words, but in actions. And the courthouse was becoming not just a place of law, but a place of justice in its truest form. Recognizing that change must start early, Henry began a program that brought local middle and high school students into the courthouse for justice days. These events were designed to give students a first-hand look at how the legal system worked, to meet judges, attorneys, and officers, and to have open discussions about their own experiences with the law and authority figures. Henry found himself standing before classrooms full of bright-eyed teenagers, some skeptical, some curious, but all eager to have their voices heard. He didn't shy away from hard conversations. I know that for some of you, the police and the courts aren't seen as your friends. Henry admitted during one session, but I want you to know that we're here to serve you, to protect your rights, and to make sure that the law is fair for everyone. And if you ever feel like that's not the case, speak up. We need your voices. The students responded with questions and stories. One young black girl talked about how her brother had been unfairly stopped and frisked by police. A white boy admitted that he didn't understand why his black friends were so afraid of the police when he never had any issues. A Latina student expressed her fears about immigration enforcement and how it affected her family's sense of security. Henry encouraged open dialogue, emphasizing the need for understanding and empathy. And as the program grew, he saw its impact. Students who once distrusted the law began to see it as something that could work for them, not against them. The program gave them hope, empowered them to stand up for their rights, and inspired some to consider careers in law criminal justice, and public service. For Henry, these justice days were some of the most rewarding moments of his career. He knew that if he could inspire even a few young minds to pursue justice and fairness, 
then he was helping to shape a future where equality was more than just an aspiration. It was a reality. Not everyone welcomed the changes with open arms. The local police union, concerned about the reforms being implemented, pushed back hard, claiming that the new policies were making it harder for officers to do their jobs. You're tying our hands, one union representative said during a heated meeting with Henry, Chief Nelson, and other community leaders. These reforms make officers second-guess every decision. It's going to get people hurt. Henry listened carefully, understanding that there was a balance to be struck between law enforcement's need to protect and serve effectively and the community's right to be treated fairly. He knew that fear and resistance were natural responses to change, especially when that change challenged long-standing practices and beliefs. Officer safety is important, Henry acknowledged, his voice calm but resolute. But so is community safety. We're not trying to make your jobs harder. We're trying to make them better, better for the officers and better for the people you serve. And that means holding everyone, from the police to the community, accountable. The discussion was long and intense, with officers and community leaders speaking passionately about their concerns, fears, and hopes for the future. But amidst the heated exchanges, there were moments of understanding, moments when both sides acknowledged the challenges they faced and the need for mutual respect. In the end, Henry and Chief Nelson were able to find common ground with the union, agreeing to implement the reforms gradually while providing additional support and training for officers. It wasn't a perfect solution, but it was a step toward finding balance and building trust. And Henry knew that trust, once earned, could become the foundation for even greater progress. Amidst the intense work and public advocacy, Henry made sure to carve out time for his family. One weekend, the Gaines family hosted a backyard barbecue, inviting friends, neighbors, and colleagues to join them for a day of relaxation and celebration. The smell of grilled food filled the air and the sounds of laughter, music, and children playing created a joyous atmosphere. Henry stood at the grill, flipping burgers and laughing with old friends. Diane, always the perfect hostess, made sure everyone was well-fed and comfortable. Sarah and Michael ran around with their friends, enjoying the rare chance to let loose without thinking about school or the pressures of their parents' public lives. As the sun began to set, Henry found a quiet moment to sit down with Diane, a plate of food in his lap and a smile on his face. I don't know how you do it, she teased, leaning in to give him a quick kiss. Balancing the courthouse, the community work, and still making time to be here for all of us. Henry shrugged, his eyes twinkling with warmth. It's not always easy, he admitted, but I couldn't do any of this without you and the kids. You're my foundation, my support, and every time I think about giving up, I remember that I'm not just fighting for justice in the courthouse. I'm fighting for a better world for all of us. They clinked their glasses together in a quiet toast, savoring the peace of the moment. And as Henry looked around at the people gathered in his backyard, people who had stood by him, who believed in him, he felt a deep sense of gratitude. He was a judge, an advocate, a father, a husband. And in that moment, surrounded by the people he loved, he felt whole. Weeks after the police union's pushback, Henry received a call from an unexpected source. Sergeant Kelly, a senior white officer in the police department, who had long been known for his strict by-the-book approach. Kelly had never openly opposed Henry's reforms, but he hadn't shown support for them either. To Henry, the call seemed out of the blue. Judge Gaines, Kelly said in a gravelly voice over the phone. I'd like to meet with you, privately. Henry agreed, curious to understand what this meeting might entail. They decided to meet at a local coffee shop away from the courthouse and the prying eyes of the department. When Henry walked into the shop, he spotted Kelly sitting at a corner table, dressed casually in a t-shirt and jeans. The sergeant's face was hard to read, his eyes fixed on the cup of coffee in his hands. Henry sat down across from him, and for a moment, they both sat in silence, the aroma of fresh coffee filling the space between them. Why did you want to meet? Henry finally asked, his tone measured but open. Kelly let out a sigh, glancing up at Henry. Because I think I was wrong, he admitted, his voice low. I spent years believing that policing was about force, about control. But ever since these reforms came in, I've started to see things differently. I've seen how much better things can be when we take the time to listen, 
to understand, and I wanted to say thank you. Henry was surprised by Kelly's admission. Thank you? He repeated, his voice tinged with curiosity. Yeah, Kelly nodded. Thank you for not giving up, for pushing even when we push back. I know a lot of us gave you a hard time, but I want you to know that there are officers, like me, who are learning, who are growing. And I want to be part of making this department better, just like you. The conversation continued for hours, two men who had once been on opposite sides finding common ground. By the time they left the coffee shop, Henry felt as though a new door had been opened, one that could lead to even more meaningful change from within the police force itself. And as Kelly shook his hand and promised to be an advocate for justice, Henry couldn't help but feel that they were turning a corner. With the reforms taking effect and the community growing closer, Chief Nelson and Judge Gaines decided to hold a joint press conference to address the public about their progress. The event was held on the courthouse steps with reporters, community members, and police officers gathered to hear their message. Henry stood beside Chief Nelson, the media's cameras flashing as they prepared to speak. Chief Nelson opened the conference with a powerful speech. When we talk about justice, we often talk about the law, he began. But justice is about more than laws. It's about how we treat one another, how we protect and serve our communities. And I am proud to stand with Judge Gaines, whose courage and commitment have helped us become better at what we do. Henry stepped forward to the podium, looking out at the faces before him, some familiar, some not. This is not just my story, he said, his voice carrying over the crowd. This is our story, a story of a community coming together to demand better, to fight for what's right, and to create a future where justice is truly for everyone. We still have a long way to go, but we are making progress, and we are making it together. After their speeches, the floor was open for questions. Reporters asked about the specifics of the reforms, the challenges they had faced, and their hopes for the future. Henry and Chief Nelson answered each question with honesty and conviction, emphasizing that the changes they were implementing were not just about reacting to a single incident. They were about building a lasting culture of fairness, respect, and accountability. The press conference ended on a high note, with applause from the audience and positive coverage from the media. For Henry, it felt like a turning point, a public acknowledgement of the hard work that had gone into making the community a safer, more inclusive place. And as he left the courthouse steps, he knew that the best way to honor that progress was to keep pushing forward, one step at a time. As much as Henry focused on the external work of reform, he also made sure to stay connected with his family, especially his son, Michael, who was navigating the complexities of being a young black man in today's world. Michael had always admired his father's strength, but he also struggled with the realities of being seen as a threat simply because of his skin color. One night, as they sat together on the porch, Michael turned to his father with a serious expression. Dad, can I ask you something? He began hesitantly. How do you stay so strong when people treat you like, like you're not even human? How do you deal with that? Henry felt a pang of sadness as he looked at his son, wishing he could shield him from the pain of racism. It's not easy, son, Henry admitted, his voice softening. There are days when it feels like no matter what I do, some people will always see me as less. But I remember why I do what I do. I fight for justice because it's right. And I do it for you, for your sister, for our community. So that maybe one day you won't have to face the same struggles. Michael nodded, absorbing his father's words. But what if things don't change? He asked. What if no matter what we do, people still see us that way? Henry reached over placing a hand on Michael's shoulder. Then we keep fighting, he said firmly, because giving up isn't an option. Change doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen without people who are willing to stand up and make a difference. And I believe that one day things will get better, but until then, we have to keep pushing, keep speaking out, and keep believing in our worth. Michael looked at his father with newfound resolve, a determination mirrored in his eyes. Then I'll fight too he said quietly. I'll make sure that people know who we are and what we stand for. And in that moment, Henry saw not just his son, but a young man ready to take on the world, to carry forward the fight for justice 
with the same strength and courage that had guided his own journey. As Henry continued his work, he was honored by an unexpected recognition, a nomination for a community leadership award given to those who had made a significant impact in their city. The award ceremony was to be held at a grand banquet hall downtown with city officials, community leaders, and honorees gathering for an evening of celebration and recognition. Dressed in a tailored suit, Henry arrived at the event with Diane, who wore a stunning dress that complemented her elegance and grace. They were greeted by applause as they entered the hall, hand in hand, and Henry couldn't help but feel a mixture of pride and humility. This wasn't just a personal honor. It was a testament to the power of standing up for what was right, even when it was difficult. As Henry took the stage to accept his award, he looked out at the sea of faces, people who had supported him, fought alongside him, and believed in his vision for justice. This award isn't just for me, he said, his voice filled with gratitude. It's for everyone who has faced injustice and refused to back down. It's for those who fight for a world where all are treated with dignity and respect. And it's for my family who have stood by me through every step of this journey. The applause that followed was loud and heartfelt. And as Henry walked off the stage, he was met with handshakes, hugs, and congratulations from all sides. Diane's eyes were filled with tears of pride, and she embraced him tightly. You did it, she whispered. You've made such a difference, and I couldn't be prouder. The evening was filled with warmth, laughter, and a sense of community. And as Henry stood amidst friends, allies, and loved ones, he felt a deep sense of fulfillment, a reminder that the fight for justice was not a lonely one, but one that brought people together in the name of progress and hope. Uh, months later, while Henry was visiting a neighboring courthouse for a case review, he had a chance encounter that would leave a lasting impact. As he walked through the bustling hallway, he was approached by a young black man who looked to be in his early 20s, with a determined yet hesitant expression. Judge Gaines, the young man asked, his voice carrying a hint of awe. I don't know if you remember me, but I was in your courtroom about a year ago. You presided over my case when I was arrested for something I didn't do. You listened to me, you treated me with respect, and you gave me a chance. Henry paused, searching the young man's face for recognition. And then it hit him, the case of a young man wrongfully accused of theft whose life could have taken a very different path if not for a fair ruling. Yes, I remember you, Henry said, smiling warmly. You've come a long way since then. The young man nodded, a proud smile spreading across his face. I have. Because of you, I was able to finish school, stay out of trouble, and I'm starting law school next fall. I want to make a difference, just like you. Henry's heart swelled with pride and joy. This was what it was all about giving people the chance to be seen for who they were, to have their voices heard, and to have the opportunity to thrive. I'm proud of you, Henry said sincerely, and I know you're going to do great things. Just remember to keep fighting for what's right and never forget where you come from. The young man nodded, his eyes shining with gratitude. I won't, sir. Thank you for everything. As they parted ways, Henry felt a renewed sense of purpose. He had come full circle from facing injustice himself to ensuring that others received the justice they deserved. And with each life he touched, each person he inspired, he knew that the fight for equality and fairness was worth every challenge, every struggle, and every victory. With all the changes and efforts to build trust between the police, courts, and community, something remarkable began to happen. The town started to come together in ways it never had before. Neighborhood associations held more events with police officers as guests, building relationships through simple interactions like barbecues, basketball games, and community cleanups. The courthouse became not just a place of law, but a place of learning, outreach, and support. Henry was invited to speak at one of the town's annual Unity Days, a festival meant to celebrate diversity, culture, and togetherness. The event was held in a large park with booths showcasing different local businesses, cultural performances on a stage, and families enjoying picnics on the grass. People of all ages, races, and backgrounds filled the park, embodying the very definition of community. As Henry took the stage, 
the sun casting a warm glow over the festival, he saw faces of every shade looking back at him, children sitting on their parents' shoulders, elders sitting in lawn chairs, and teenagers huddled in groups. We are more than just a town, Henry began, his voice carrying through the open air. We are a family, a family that has faced challenges, that has struggled, but that has come out stronger together. He spoke about the importance of unity, of listening to each other, and of creating a place where everyone felt valued and respected. It hasn't always been easy, he admitted, but look at where we are today, together, stronger, and more united than ever. And I believe that as long as we stand together, there's nothing we can't overcome. The crowd erupted into cheers, clapping and raising their hands in celebration. The sense of joy and hope was palpable, and Henry felt a swell of pride in his heart. Unity Day ended with a parade through the streets, officers walking hand in hand with residents, children waving flags, and music filling the air. For a moment, it felt like a glimpse of the future, a future where equality, justice, and love guided everything they did. One morning as Henry was preparing for his day in chambers, he received a knock on his door. It was a representative from the governor's office, a well-dressed woman with a polite but businesslike demeanor. Judge Gaines, it's a pleasure to meet you, she said, extending her hand. I've been sent to speak with you about an important matter. Henry invited her to sit, curiosity piqued. As she began to explain, he realized that the governor had taken notice of his work, his commitment to justice, the police reforms, the community building efforts. The governor would like to offer you a position on the State Commission for Justice and Equality, she said, her voice brimming with enthusiasm. Your leadership and insight could help shape policies that would benefit the entire state. We would be honored to have you serve. Henry sat back, processing the magnitude of the offer. A position on the State Commission would mean more influence, more responsibility, and the ability to advocate for change on a larger scale. But it would also mean a new set of challenges, more time away from his family, and the pressure of navigating politics on a state level. I'm honored, Henry said sincerely, but I need time to think about this, to speak with my family. Of course, the representative replied with a smile. Take all the time you need. We believe you would be an invaluable addition to the commission, and we hope you'll consider it. As she left, Henry felt a mix of excitement and hesitation. The opportunity was immense, but so were the potential sacrifices. He would need to weigh his options carefully, balancing his commitment to his community with his desire to continue being a present husband and father. That evening, Henry sat down with Diane and the kids to discuss the offer. They gathered in the living room, a fire crackling in the fireplace, and Henry laid out all the details, the position, the responsibilities, the potential impact. What do you all think? he asked, looking around at the faces he loved most. Diane was the first to speak. Henry, whatever you decide, we'll support you, she said, her voice steady but thoughtful. But this is a big decision. I know how much you love being on the front lines, in the courtroom, in the community, and I know how much you value being here with us. So you need to be sure that this is what you really want. Sarah, now in her late teens, spoke next. Dad, you always tell us to do what we're passionate about, she said. If you think you can make a real difference on this commission, then go for it. But if it's going to make you unhappy, uh, well, maybe it's not worth it. Michael nodded in agreement. You've always said that we should find balance in life, he added. Maybe you can find a way to do both. Serve on the commission, but still be here for the community and for us. Henry smiled, grateful for his family's honesty and insight. He realized that while the opportunity to serve on the commission was an honor, it didn't have to define his path. He could still make an impact from where he was, still be a judge, a father, a husband, and a community leader. And perhaps one day, the time would be right to serve on a larger scale. I think you're all right, Henry said finally. For now, my place is here, right where I am, fighting for justice in our town, supporting our family and making a difference in the ways I know how. And maybe someday, if the time is right, I'll take on something bigger, but not yet. The family shared a sense of relief and joy, knowing that their bond and their values would guide whatever choices they made together. And as they sat together that evening, they felt a renewed sense of purpose and love.
Months passed and Henry continued to make strides in the courthouse, the police department, and the community. But one day a case came before him that tested everything he stood for, a case involving a young black man falsely accused of a crime he didn't commit. The evidence was flimsy, the prosecution was overzealous, and it was clear to Henry that this young man was being targeted based on his race. Henry presided over the case with the utmost care, ensuring that every piece of evidence was thoroughly examined and that the young man received a fair trial. The young man's public defender, an earnest young lawyer, fought hard to prove his client's innocence, and the courtroom was filled with tension as the trial unfolded. In the end, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty, and the young man's family erupted into tears of relief. Henry watched as the young man hugged his mother, who wept openly, thanking God for the verdict. It was a moment of triumph, not just for the defendant, but for justice itself, a reminder that the system could work when fairness, integrity, and diligence guided its path. As the courtroom emptied, Henry sat back in his chair, reflecting on the journey that had brought him here. It wasn't always easy, and the fight for justice was far from over. But moments like this, moments where a life was saved, a truth was revealed, and a young man was given a second chance, made every challenge worthwhile. He banged his gavel one final time that day, feeling the power and responsibility of his role. And as he left the courthouse, he knew that he would continue to fight for those who couldn't fight for themselves to use his position to make sure that the scales of justice remain balanced for all. Years later, as Henry walked through the now familiar halls of the courthouse, he couldn't help but marvel at how far they had come. The town had changed, grown, and healed in so many ways. Officers and community members worked together to keep neighborhoods safe. The courthouse operated with fairness and transparency, and the young people who once viewed the justice system with suspicion now saw it as a place of hope. Henry's children had grown up following their own passions and making their marks on the world. Sarah had become a teacher dedicated to empowering the next generation with knowledge and critical thinking. Michael was in his final year of college, majoring in social work with dreams of becoming a community organizer. And Diane continued to be his rock, his partner in every step of their shared journey. One day, as Henry prepared to step down from the bench after a long career, the courthouse staff surprised him with a farewell celebration. Judges, clerks, lawyers, officers, and community members filled the courtroom, applauding as Henry walked in, stunned by the outpouring of love and respect. They presented him with a plaque, recognizing his years of service and his dedication to justice. As Henry stood before them, his voice choked with emotion, he gave his final speech as a judge. This is not the end, he said. This is a beginning, a beginning of a future, where we continue to strive for justice, to fight for what's right, and to build a world where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. I may be stepping down from the bench, but I will never stop fighting for the ideals we all believe in. The room erupted into cheers, and as Henry looked out at the faces before him, he saw the reflection of a legacy, a legacy of hope, of fairness, and of unyielding determination to make the world a better place. And with that, Henry Gaines left the courtroom one last time, not as a judge, but as a man who had given everything to the fight for justice.